My name is Benno Lagner. I am the head of the Division for International Security Policy in the Swiss Foreign Ministry. And in addition, I also have a second hat, which is the one of being the ambassador for nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. I joined the Swiss um, Foreign Service about 20 years ago. I have been serving in a variety of posts, mainly multilateral work, a lot of it related to the United Nations, and now um, for the last couple of months working on disarmament and non-proliferation issues. I studied international relations. In that context, we also had courses on security policy. Um, that was during the Cold War period, so we heard a lot about the nuclear doctrines of the two major superpowers. And uh, that was the first time I really sort of started uh, looking a little bit deeper into the whole issue of nuclear weapons. And uh, then when I was uh, working with the then president of the General Assembly, Mr. Josef Deiss, in 2010-2011, I had the opportunity to visit Hiroshima with him and to really see for myself uh, what devastating consequences the use of nuclear weapons can have. And a very touching moment was, of course, also meeting with two survivors, one from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who really retold their personal experience. And it was uh, quite a horrific um, experience listening to this first-hand account. Well, it definitely has strengthened my conviction that we really have to do everything to rid the world of these weapons. And uh, so it has also given this, uh, this element of um, a strong personal interest besides the, the professional interest in this issue and uh, an additional motivation to really be active in this area. Well, the end goal to reach a world of free of nuclear weapons, of course, has to be a legally binding agreement. We're not there yet where we could really begin formal negotiations on such an agreement. But we need to prepare the groundwork. We need to really um, strengthen the case why we should move in that direction. Uh, so one of the first challenges is really to make a much stronger case than has been made in the past for delegitimizing nuclear weapons, uh, to explain not only to diplomats and security specialists, but also to the wider public why we should move in that direction. Nuclear weapons are so remote so that for many people, especially in those parts of the world where you do not have nuclear weapons, um, it's difficult to get people interested in this issue with the same um, strength and conviction. So that's one of the challenges, which is why Switzerland has made it a specific issue to really focus on this delegitimizing element as a key to creating the momentum to um, make progress in this area. Nuclear weapon states always say how important nuclear weapons have been to maintain stability and overall strategic, uh, a strategic balance. Uh, we have been told that thanks to nuclear weapons we have not had another major global world war since 1945. And so there have been a lot of myths that have been created about the utility of these weapons uh, and, and the role they play for ensuring our security. And we really have to tackle these myths. We have to show that these weapons uh, do not have this role, but rather more that they are an existential threat to our world and to humanity, that we can create security without these nuclear weapons, that um, the role has been overstated and to really show that any use of these nuclear weapons would have catastrophic humanitarian consequences.
The starting point really is the 2010 final document of the MPT review conference. And there, for the first time, we had an explicit reference to this humanitarian dimension, which has two aspects. One is the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. And the second element was a clear um, message that all states at all times have to comply with international humanitarian law. Now, international humanitarian law is a body of law that governs the conduct of hostil hostilities. And there are some fundamental principles and rules that are part of international humanitarian law, such as there has to be a st distinction between civilian and military targets, there is the rule of proportionality, the prohibition to cause unnecessary suffering, the prohibition to cause widespread severe damage to the environment. And if you just look at these fundamental rules, it's very easy to see that nuclear weapons violate all of these fundamental rules and principles of international humanitarian law. So this clearly explains why these weapons have to be delegitimized. So the, the international humanitarian law argument, but I would say even more so the catastrophic humanitarian consequences argument, really provide a very convincing case. We felt very encouraged um, when we were preparing for this PREPCOM uh, to see that uh, quite a number of other countries also feel very strongly about this issue and uh, that they were willing to work with us to draft a joint statement. We had 16 countries in the end. And we really wanted to send a powerful message that uh, we don't just want to leave the issue where it is in the 2010 final document, that it's not only an issue that might concern Switzerland and some other countries on an individual national level, but there is a group of countries who want to give joint visibility to this issue. We feel very encouraged that it has clearly emerged as a key issue of the discussions here at this PREPCOM and has generated a widespread interest. First of all, I think we have to mobilise more countries into joining us and making a case about it. So the next goal would of course be to have a joint statement that many more countries would sign up to. Secondly, we have to raise this issue in all available venues. Uh, so we've now clearly made it a focus of this NPT review cycle. Uh, we very much welcome the fact that the Norwegian government will be hosting a conference on the uh, humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons next spring in Oslo. Uh, we will also look at how we can um, give more visibility to this issue in the General Assembly, in the first committee. And really, this, it's important to firmly establish this issue on the agenda. The second thing is really to stimulate the debate by being very practical, showing really the practical consequences that the use of nuclear weapons would have. So a second uh, priority for us at this PREPCOM was also to present a study that uh, clearly showed what the effect of a limited nuclear war would be on the global climate, what that effect again would have on agricultural production and food security. And this, of course, also helps to spread the message to areas that, as I mentioned before, might not be so concerned about nuclear weapons per se, if you take, for example, Africa, where you do not have any nuclear weapon states, but for whom food security is a key concern. So it will also help to mobilise constituencies outside the traditional disarmament constituencies to drive forward the message why we have to do something about it and why we have to really now take uh, the commitment to move towards a nuclear weapons free world much more seriously. The CTPT is of course an important stepping stone to move towards the world 
free of nuclear weapons. Switzerland was one of the first countries to sign and ratify the CTPT. And we also in our statement here again highlighted the importance of this treaty. Uh, we also uh, welcomed the fact that Indonesia as one of the Annex II countries has now ratified uh, the treaty. And of course, if you're talking about the challenges, the main challenge is really to get the eight remaining Annex II countries to ratify the treaty. We also just recently saw the publication of a study by the US Academy of Science which made a very strong case why, for technical reasons, there is no problem for the United States to ratify the CTBT. And of course, ratification by the US would have a signal effect or could trigger a signal effect also regarding other Annex II countries. So that's where we really have to focus our work on now. There are, of course, different views of how to get to this world without nuclear weapons, a more ambitious um, road with a nuclear weapons convention or a framework of separate agreements covering different areas, uh, as the Secretary General of the United Nations has mentioned. And whether you take this or the other route, of course, if you want to ban nuclear weapons, you have to ban the testing of nuclear weapons. So the CTBT is a necessary element and stepping stone to move towards that direction of a ban on nuclear weapons. Uh, the CTBT has, of course, both the disarmament and non-proliferation aspect. Uh, the disarmament aspect clearly means preventing the qualitative further development of nuclear weapons. So it has there a very strong qualitative disarmament effect, but also making sure that no other countries acquire nuclear weapons, so preventing the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries. That's the importance of the CTBT. It is a necessary element of the larger framework we will need in order to ban nuclear weapons. Civil society has a very important role to play. I mean, if we also look at some of the most recent disarmament treaties in the area of mines or cluster munition, Civil society had a very strong role to mobilise public opinion to create the necessary momentum to move towards um, action. And it's the same in this case. We really need civil society to raise awareness about the issue. Uh, we need civil society to mobilise public opinion. We need um, Red Cross societies who can clearly also highlight the humanitarian um, argument. And in that sense, we also feel very encouraged that the Council of Delegates of the Red Cross at Red Crescent Movement in November 2011 adopted a very strong resolution which both calls upon states to move forward towards um, complete nuclear disarmament, but also calls upon the national societies to raise this issue and, and, and to mobilise opinion. So really moving forward and also overcoming the opposition of the nuclear weapon states will require putting together a multi-stakeholder coalition of interested parties. States that are willing to move forward, but also other actors who um, have also a wide constituency and can support these efforts. I think disarmament education is particularly important when you come to the area of nuclear weapons because we have had one case where nuclear weapons have been used uh, in two instances in 1945 and the survivors, the Hibakusha, who can really also spread the message uh, are very old uh, and, and soon maybe none of them will be left to, to, to give a personal recount of what has happened. Uh, and then it will be even more difficult to interest future generations um, why this is an important issue. So we really need to do more to interest future generations because nuclear weapons are also really a threat for future generations. We have seen that um, following the use of the nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, there have not only been the immediate um, humanitarian consequences, but there are health concerns that get passed on to future generations. 
So especially in this area, we need to do more on disarmament education. We su Switzerland supports a lot of different initiatives. Um, we support NGOs who try to highlight this issue. We support um, courses that educate um, both future delegates to international conferences, but also students. We, we support a number of civil society organizations that specifically want to interest students and young people in this issue. And of course, it's very important also that international organizations like your organization also have a very strong education element as part of their activities.